Hey, hello, and welcome to this Voxpole Research Workshop. I'm Stuart MacDonald. I'm a professor of law at Swansea University. I'm director of the university's Cyber Threats Research Centre, and I'm also the coordinator of the Voxpole Network. If you haven't heard of Voxpole before, we are a, a network of academics, um, 65 academics in total across 25 universities in 13 different countries. And we work collaboratively together on a range of different activities. Uh, if you haven't visited the Voxpole website before, please go and check that out and see some of the different activities that we organize. Uh, but one of the things that we seek to do is to host research workshops like the one today. So today's title is the normalization of extremist subculture. And I'd like to start by introducing our four panelists. And we have Dr. Suraj Lakhani from the University of Sussex, Dr. Wida Moran from the University of Exeter, Professor Jonathan Peaslack from the City College of New York, and Dr. Ashton Kingdon from the University of Southampton. So the format for the session, we're going to hear from the, the four panelists in turn. They'll each speak for 10 minutes or so. Uh, Suraj is going to speak about video gaming. Then Weeder is going to speak about the use of humor. And then Jonathan will be speaking about music. And finally, Ashton will be speaking about the occult. Um, as you're listening to them, if you have questions, please do pop those in the chat because the second half of the workshop will be devoted to Q&A. So we'll have plenty of time to work through your questions. And I'd also just like to remind everyone that the session is being recorded. Uh, so if you want to uh, catch up or rewatch any of what you, you hear in the workshop, you'll be able to watch the recording in due course on the Voxpol YouTube channel. But with that introduction out of the way, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, which is Suraj. Thank you, Suraj. Thank you, Stuart. If you can just uh, bring up the slides, it'd be great. Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so I haven't got a, a huge amount, to talk, uh, amount of time to talk today, but I just wanted to introduce uh, an issue that we're seeing uh, emerge within online gaming. And the purpose of my short presentation today isn't to outline any research or findings. Um, the lack of work in this area is really kind of part of the issue. And it's about introducing uh, an issue that we've not really spent enough time thinking about and then to take those considerations and, uh, and explore them a little bit more during the discussion section towards the end of the workshop today. Um, but before I do that, I'll provide a, a brief background. So you can go to the next slide, please. And one more. Lovely. So the video gaming sector is considered to be one of the fastest growing industries. Uh, it was estimated in, in 2021 that there were around uh, 2.8 billion gamers globally and revenues in the region of about 189 billion US dollars. When specifically considering online gaming, it's thought that by 2025, uh, audiences are projected to surpass around 1.3 billion users and revenue will be around 19 billion US dollars. There are, of course, uh, numerous positive economic, health, social and psychological benefits of gaming. However, as technology develops, as we know from, from all of our work, so do the associated harms with new challenges constantly presented. Within this example, the intersections with extremism and violent extremism are of particular concern. Within the EU and for that matter, uh, global policy, security and counterterrorism circles, there is a growing concern for the intersection between video gaming and violent extremism. And although the general overlaps between video gaming and violent extremism have existed for decades, and there is some important and insightful research, this intersection has really kind of been poorly understood. Um, as, I, as I argued in a, a EU radicalization awareness network paper on video gaming and violent extremism, extremism last year, there is a a distinct lack of particularly empirical research and literature in this area of study with work at an emergent stage. Saying that of late, increasing work has been dedicated to better understanding this phenomenon, including the establishment of various uh, interdisciplinary and cross-sector partnerships. Uh, Stuart, can you get to the next slide, please? However, this research tends to focus on the convergence between often organized and intentional in initiatives by violent extremists. 
Um, in, in that recent research that I, I mentioned for the, for the European Commission, I argued that, as expected, there are coordinated attempts of far-right extremist networks and organisations, and jihadists, of course, as well, um, within online spaces, mostly top-down, in order to uh, uh, do things like connect with like-minded others for community building, for possibly radicalization and recruitment as well. Uh, but saying that more research needs to be conducted to better determine the breadth and depth of radicalization and recruitment within these contexts. As well as this, we need to consider an aspect that might not be about an organized attempt by extremist groups and networks. What's, what is really particularly overlooked is, is what has been termed as everyday extremism and its implications on wider society. And I believe I heard uh, Nick Robinson, University of Leeds mentioned that term first. So this is less about organized extremist networks who have targeted approaches to use video games to radicalize, recruit, attack plan, but more so about those everyday users who espouse rhetoric and symbols that are connected to far right extremism, but are not necessarily part of uh, any networks or committed to any ideology. And my interest in this topic was really kind of sparked after an informal chat with some of my students during my final year undergrad module called uh, Critical Perspectives on Terrorism. And during one of our seminars, which covered the general intersection between video gaming and violent extremism, I asked the students, I asked my students if any of them were gamers. And unsurprisingly, about half of the students uh, within the class played online games. And within that half, roughly 30 to 40% were female gamers. And during this chat, numerous students outlined their own personal experiences with online multiplayer gaming. And they recounted the regularity of hearing racial slurs, misogynistic language, and other xenophobic language. And of course, this is not surprising, uh, especially considering some of the inherent issues within online gaming we've seen over the years, discussed within various academic studies, including uh, the Gamergate scandal as one particular example. The students also mentioned hearing over voice chat what they described as far-right extremism linked terminology, including mention of Nazis, Hitler, uh, concentration camps, uh, and other uh, general anti-Semitism. Of course, the latter doesn't necessarily equate to far-right extremism and can be linked to hate crime as well, of course. Um, they're also discussing neo-Nazi representations in gamer tags or profile pictures uh, depicting white supremacist symbols. So we need to think about this within the context of everyday extremism, as we mentioned earlier, and ask ourselves whether all people engaging in these types of activities are ideologically driven, and if not, what are the implications for countering these issues in PCVE work? So do, um, do some people engage with these types of activities, i.e. saying something that's racist or misog misogynistic or displaying Nazi symbols or whatever it is under the guise of it being a joke or of what we now refer to as shitposting post uh, Christchurch attack. And it can be reasonably be argued when we draw parallels to wider work on jihadist terrorism that some espouse uh, far-right extremist rhetoric due to a perception of it being cool or edgy or funny. And this is particularly concerning as many of the students I spoke to, again, this is, an, this is anecdotal in nature, but something we're, we're beginning to see in emerging research, that these types of gaming experiences are part of the normal environment and something that they experience a lot of the time. And when I say anecdotal in nature, um, I have spoken to numerous, it wasn't just that, that class, I have spoken to numerous students within a range of classes over 18 months, and many were saying similar things. So this really got me thinking about what this meant and, and and how to start unpicking it, especially when um, a number of students I spoke to described far-right extremist related rhetoric, which they encountered whilst gaming as something that's, uh, as one said, just gamer chat and part of gaming culture. And this is, you know, especially concerning considering the, the global prominence of the video gaming industry, as I mentioned earlier, and also the cultural importance of some of the formative experiences gaming represents. What this does is overlap with increasing anxieties around the normalization and mainstreaming of narratives, ideas, rhetoric, and ideologies associated with far-right extremism. And research in this area is primarily focused on how narratives associated with the far-right can become emboldened through uh, media and political discourse, uh, social media, and within educational settings as well. And as a result, this normalization and mainstreaming of far-right extremism can become more pronounced within public rhetoric something that can also be capitalized upon by far-right extremists. However, although some research exists on hate and gaming, scant attention has been paid to how the normalization and mainstreaming of narratives, ideas, rhetoric, and ideologies associated with far-right extremism, particularly from kind of a bottom-up approach, overlaps with video gaming and how, this, how in turn this phenomenon contributes to this, these concerns. 
Um, so Little was really kind of understood on how these cultural developments intersect with wider, <coughs> excuse me, wider uh, subcultural con uh, considerations at the at the phenomenological foreground. Saying that there was you know some really great research emerging in this area by the ADL, also uh, Dr. Rachel Cowart's research and one or two others as well. So where do we go from here? Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Jim. And just click all the way to the bottom. There's one more. Great. Uh, so where do we go from here? Well, work needs to be conducted in this area to determine how and what to extent does the normalization and mainstreaming of far-right extremism occur in gaming. And we need to think about what impacts this has on gaming communities and better understand the extent to which this plays a role in radicalization trajectories and also kind of desensitizing, desensitizing individuals to violence. But that really needs to be thought out about in, de thought about in detail uh, in terms of how this will be undertaken and also the methodological and op operational implications. So if we are to conduct research in this area, how do we ethically collect data considering some of this will be about voice chat within games and gaming environments? How do we go about gaining consent? Do we need to consider this? Ethics committees at universities are really struggling to catch up with this type of research, as, as I'm sure many of you can identify with uh, in terms of your own ethics proposals when conducting research on uh, social media and other online spaces. In turn, we also need to consider what gaming companies need to do as well. There are kind of aspects that we know for sure, like gaming companies need to work more closely with organizations like GIFCT and Tech Against Terrorism, like uh, some gaming platforms and associated platforms have started to do, and also to update their policies in terms of service to be really clear about what types of behavior are and aren't allowed on their platforms and the implications for people if they break these terms of service. It's only uh, very recently that some gaming companies have really started to update their terms of service, but there are other gaming companies that still need to catch up as well. But what, what's more difficult is, is, is about kind of monitoring these types of activities. Um, how do game, gaming companies ensure voice and text chat isn't being abused by its users without really impinging on privacy and freedom of speech, of course. Um, today, today, I really kind of wanted to highlight this area that's been largely unexplored, but one that's really seemingly increasingly becoming an, an issue and one that has serious implications. And again, this is not about a coordinated approach by extremist organizations to community build or disseminate propaganda or to radicalize and recruit, but to highlight the gap in research that focuses on the everyday extremism um, that many see within games and on gaming platforms to understand the implication that this has on radicalization trajectories and desensitizing individuals with violence. And with this, to really kind of pose some important considerations that future research needs to consider, something uh, that I can hope we can expand upon within the uh, discussion after the presentations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Siraj, and we'll hand straight over to Wida next. Thank you very much. Um, well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning if you're joining from different parts of the world. And uh, I don't have a presentation, but I will discuss some of the research I've done here at the University of Exeter with some of my graduate students on humor, and particularly humor in uh, jihadi rhetoric and the subculture that it has created, subculture of extremism that it has created. So the context of the broader uh, context of this research is in jihadi culture, which is uh, essentially focusing on the fact that militancy is not just about uh, military operations, about objectives and strategic thinking in terms of military, that jihadi groups also focus on ritual, on customs, dress code, and music, film, storytelling, telling sports jokes um, food even um, they do discuss poetry uh, dreams uh, um, in fact the concept of dream and speaking about dreams is uh, uh, quite um, frequently happens in uh, jihadi rhetoric especially in groups such as al-qaeda and is 
Um, other other uh, aspects of culture that um, um, happens is depicted in various media products is group in of these groups uh, such as Al Qaeda, IS, the Taliban is also, for example, weeping openly, pers personal humility, artistic sensitivity, sensitivity, um, and display of new uh, emotions. Uh, um, for example, Bin Laden is um, as like as um, as other some other um, uh, leaders of the groups uh, is depicted as weeping frequently and talking, uh, discussing his emotions uh, um, about different topics. And humor is another um, uh, another aspect of the political rhetoric of these groups that hasn't been explored as much. So what do we mean uh, by humor in general and why is it important? Uh, so this is basically focused on political humor, uh, which is essentially an umbrella term uh, that is depicting uh, irony, satire, uh, ridicule, parody, mockery, and scorn, for example. Um, however, it should be noted that humor and laughter are um, two separate phenomena. Not always humor leads to laughter. And um, political humor um, highlights the inconsistencies and inadequacies of political decisions and actions. Uh, it focuses on political uh, leaders, their incompetencies, uh, recklessness, corruption. So these are some of the topics that are uh, the focus of political humor. And in order for the political humor to have its effect, a shared language and understanding is needed to distinguish between sincerity of the topic, the sarcasm and irony. So it is this shared language and understanding of the context that is extremely important when we explore a topic such as humor and in, uh, in rhetoric of various jihadi uh, extremist groups. Um, in our research, we focus on, uh, as I mentioned, humor, but also the boundaries of humor. Where do these groups such as Al-Qaeda, IS, the Taliban, Tahrir the Taliban of Pakistan, draw boundaries on humor and what, what type of humor is acceptable and what type of humor is not acceptable? And we, we detected uh, various forms of humor in these groups. Uh, these are dehumanizing humor, ironic and uh, sarcastic humor, mockery uh, or mocking humor and situational humor. So our research is basically taking a, a comparative uh, approach to studying uh, the groups that I mentioned, Al-Qaeda, IS, the Taliban and Tahrik Taliban of Pakistan. And uh, in terms of methodology, we often focus both on uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, methods. So um, some of the prominent themes, as I uh, briefly mentioned, these are ironic and sarcastic humor, for example. This is the language that um, conveys a distinction between what is literally said and the intended meaning of this statement. Um, ISIS and TTP, for example, uh, are a very a lot more likely than other groups to resort to ironic and sarcastic sarcasm, uh, um, other types of uh, humor, mocking humor, mocking humor essentially directs, uh, um, is directed towards the other and it's very aggressive in a style, it converts characteristics of the target into accusation, uh, particularly incompetence, uh, and the, the other or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the target of this type of humor, as you can imagine, is often, uh, um, depending on the group, is often uh, um, soldiers, for example, foreign soldiers, uh, uh, Western governments, Western politicians, uh, so on and so forth. And then one type of humor, which uh, is slightly different from mocking or sarcastic and ironic humor um, is uh, situational humor. The situational humor, the way we define it is the use of humor and this often is nostalgic uh, in the nostalgic context, which is contextualized in narratives or firsthand experience and accounts of uh, um, events that uh, were experienced by jihadi militants. Um, situational humor, for example, normalizes uh, events such as hijra, uh, leaving one's home and traveling abroad to join jihad or jihadi arena, 
Um, and this, this is tailored towards depicting that whole journey and experience as being a light and easy and a very easy task to do. Um, this demonstrates that um, whoever has taken this journey encountered some difficulties, however, they could easily overcome it. They could easily overcome it with smiles, with jokes and laughter. And it also shows a level of camaraderie that highlights groups cohesion and support that these individuals who left their house and um, for example, from the West uh, and wanted to take the trip all the way to Syria or to South Asia in order to join various jihadi groups, they encountered some difficulties, but at the same time, they overcome it with humor, with narrating their stories with humor and how easy it was for them to actually overcome those difficulties and problems. Um, so as I said, this type of humor is slightly different from other types of humor, uh, uh, other types of humor. So what, what role does humor play? What's the purpose of humor in the jihadi rhetoric? Um, Important, as I mentioned, it is understanding the context of jokes is extremely important. That actually is, uh, there should be an, uh, a shared understanding of the background and the context. And it is uh, basically um, contributes to the um, construction of identity, us versus them, that that is basically setting the in-group against the out-group. And it strengthens the social identity. It contributes to uh, group cohesion. And it also contributes to desensitization because um, we have detected that uh, hostile language uh, from, let's say, ironic and mocking humor can actually change and go on to uh, dehumanizing humor. Um, but in, uh, basing jokes on uh, uh, dehumanizing jokes and uh, uh, referring to the other, to the enemy uh, as inan inanimate objects and attributing animalistic characteristics, for example, to the other, to the enemy. And um, animalizing actually is quite a common uh, characteristic of uh, the Islamic State, which compared to any other jihadi group, um, the Islamic State is much more likely actually to use uh, uh, dehumanizing humor to refer to other groups. So in general, this is uh, humor, uh, political humor in the rhetor jihadi rhetoric uh, um, is, is contributing to construction of identity and uh, this is often uh, widely achieved through the development of both in-group and out-group uh, and social uh, development of out-group and social identities uh, that particularly in dehumanizing humor. And um, in general, as I mentioned, there are group differences. Uh, uh, there are differences between the, uh, between the groups uh, in terms of how they utilize humor. Um, some groups such as IS and Al-Qaeda might resort to more uh, um, uh, dehumanizing and, uh, humor versus others resort to sarcastic and more mild, mild forms of humor. Uh, and the important point here is that the context is important and by the humor only works if the context is shared between uh, the audience and the narrator and um, through uh, and that context and that humor, in fact, actually also perpetuates uh, the distinctions between us versus them. Thank you. Well, hello, hello, everyone. I'll jump right in uh, to prevent Stuart from having to um, go in there. Um, let me get to my screen share first. I'll pull up my slides. Um, and I'll just play this from the start. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, and of course, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'd like to use my time today uh, to discuss three things. I wanna briefly uh, discuss the intersection of music with recent trajectories of radicalization, um, and then to address how music participates in the normalization of violent extremism. And then lastly, 
Um, I'll consider how the case study of music challenges our conceptualizations of violent extremism through the example of online content moderation. Um, given the short time, I'll offer snapshots on these three topics, but um, I like to begin as I often do with a disclaimer. And that is that I don't believe there is a causal relationship between listening to music or recitation and engaging in violent extremism. But I do believe that the cultural products are that cultural products like music catalyze many of the affective, emotional, and social processes that are critical to the radicalization, member retention, and motivation for action that we see playing out in the real world experiences of extremists. Many models of radicalization focus on specific drivers of the process, such as group dynamics, social bonding, identity fusion, emotional needs such as belonging, significance, and empowerment, among many others. Um, and it becomes interesting to intersect these with recent musical scholarship. There's a strong foundation of anthropological and musicological research showing that regardless of genre or context, music is a profound catalyst for social bonding and identifying and heightens the affective potency of verbal, nonverbal, and culturally coded messages. Music's inherent ability to forge belonging through identification and to sustain social or processes of social bonding can amplify feelings of solidarity, acceptance, and significance within a select group. Uh, while there's a lot more to say on this topic, this is one of the reasons why I think music is useful to study, and that is because it connects strongly to what we might describe as deeper trajectories of radicalization. Um, turning now to the normalization of extremism. Uh, in the lead up to this panel, I was thinking a lot about how music operates as a normalizer of extremism. And I wasn't quite sure that I had the cart and the horse all figured out quite yet. Um, the way music is deliberately operationalized in extremist cultures is highly diverse, and I'll talk about this in a moment. But I also questioned if music and most other cultural forms and activities are inherently normalizing. Uh, music is an everyday thing. Um, it's perhaps the most prevalent cultural product consumed daily on a global basis, and reflecting this, the world of extremism is quite a musical place. Now, is this because extremists are co-opting music to recruit, propagate ideology, or motivate activists? Well, the answer is yes, but music is also something that we as human beings just do. Uh, we create it, and we like to listen. And extremist groups, after all our analysis of ideology and tactics and finances, et cetera, are comprised of people who share impulses to play video games, to laugh and make humor, and to make music. Um, it would kind of be abnormal if they didn't. Even so, music isn't normalized, if you will, in the same way across the landscape of extremism. And I'll just give you a couple examples here. Um, jihadi groups like IES produce recitation within a framework of uh, theological purity, which rigidly restricts what they can and cannot do musically. Uh, the macam based pitch structure, the absence of instruments or percussion, and all of these things reflect the most conservative religious understandings of sonic articulation. Um, on the other hand, the quote unquote hate rock of American racist skinheads is virtually indistinguishable from hardcore vegan straight edge, which lies at the polar opposite position of the ideological spectrum. Um, moreover, uh, the reverse process in which extremist actors appropriate music to expound their messages happens in diverse ways. Before a group like IS began producing their own recitations, they used as video soundtracks jihad themed on a sheet by Munshi Doon unaffiliated with the group, but who nonetheless closely reflected the theological perspective on what could and could not sound in permissible recitation. Quite differently, white nationalists embrace any music involving whites as emblematic of white cultural supremacy, even if the music itself, the composers, bands, or performers have absolutely nothing to do with white nationalism. Stormfront users, uh, will accept anything all white as all right in their listening cues. And they openly share their enjoyment of like the Beach Boys, Pink Floyd, Peter Gabriel, and the list goes on. It really appears that their commitment to the cause need only go so far as the race of the band members or the headlining artist. Um, to them, these musicians unknowingly sound the superiority of whiteness simply because they're white. 
And that apparently is good enough. Finally, I want to explore the challenge that music puts forth to the concept of violent extremism using the example of content moderation. Um, and before jumping in here, um, I kind of want to outline a few prerequisites. Um, this discussion first is largely dependent upon how we choose to define a concept like violent extremism, of course. Um, I'll discuss definitions and how we might use them in a few slides. Um, I gravitate towards the idea that violent extremism exists along a, a spectrum, but for moderating content, such a perspective means that we have to draw lines and then work within consistent definitional criteria. To say the least, this is hard, um, in large part because definitions are particularly vague when it comes to the practical implementation of deciding what stays or what goes. The case of music and identifying extremist articulations within it makes navigating the terrain between protecting freedoms of expression and the propagation of violent extremism content difficult work. I'll sometimes turn to IS and its Anashid as a basis for comparison in the discussion, because we probably all agree that IS represents a violent extremist group and their recitations have been consistently removed from most platforms. Lastly, before I jump in, um, I do feel strongly um, about protecting the rights of artists and musicians to create in an environment free from censorship. Um, yet I also have to admit that I'm not naive to the impact and influence that music can have on the way we construct our social reality and the accountability that those who voice violent extremism through music should have. Now, I want to start with the very simple consideration that almost all of the top 50 most viewed videos on YouTube are music videos. Music is the most watched entity on YouTube. Um, this is very big business and how such companies handle music that approaches the margins of violent extremism has a lot at stake. So I'm going to kind of interrogate a few criteria that have been historically deployed to address music at the margins of censorship. So do we focus on the degree of hostility or rhetorical violence expressed in a song or recitation? Well, the answer is probably not. Ayas Anashid do not describe or encourage violence to any significant degree more than a lot of rap music. In fact, there's a lot of music just in general that's far more violent in its lyrics than anything ever recited by IS. So if not the degree of rhetorical violence, do we then moderate musical content on the basis of its connection to actuated violence? Well, perhaps, but drill rap is strongly associated with actuated violence, so much so that the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, recently advocated censoring this genre because it so strongly encourages and is connected to real life gang violence. Now, there are a lot of gray areas kind of when we open this Pandora's box. For example, the inhumane revenge murder misogyny of Eminem's Kim would seem rather severe, even excessive, if it was posted on an incel forum. Alternatively, do we qualify and moderate the music of violent extremism on the basis of radical sociopolitical objectives? Well, maybe, but this umbrella then would include a, quite a bit of far left and eco animal rights movement music. Um, the example I like to give here is the Earth First endorsed artist Thistle Peterson sings in her tune the BP song, quote, I say we slit their throats and watch the blood trickle like oil into all of our water, end quote. Well, certainly the words are violent enough. Earth First is well known for hostile and actuated direct action. And the group endorses radical sociopolitical changes. Um, if you know Earth First though, you probably question if they're really in the same category as IS. So where do we draw the line? Um, one other approach is that we might take a more strictly systematic one. Um, following specific markers of extremism as defined in contemporary academic research or recent regulatory efforts. And these types of qualifying markers tend to include the following. Um, and it, most of you are familiar with this, but an in-group must sustain hostile action against an out-group to secure its existence. This is JM's uh, Berger's uh, definition. Um, and if you, just a little sidebar, he uh, gave a really nice presentation several weeks ago um, on defining extremism. Um, another one is the in-group justifies violence to further social, economic, and political objectives. And then lastly, an in-group's objectives uh, involve the destruction of or fundamental change to cultural and especially state political institutions. 
Now, using these criteria is would work really, really well in the context of Salafi jihadism. It works well for Marxist and communist groups or others that brand their own content and seek to violently overthrow existing state institutions. Um, the recent EU regulation on the dissemination of terrorist content online, I think that went into effect June 7th or something, it marks as a quote unquote important factor the connection of content to specifically designated groups. Yet the sphere of white nationalism is much more fluid and much more becoming individualized, um, sometimes violently threatening to state political structures, and other times it's far more focused on non whites and Jews as the target of its violence. White nationalism's music production isn't nearly as top-down regulated or franchised as other groups. So if we start censoring music, for example, with neo-Nazi messages, which may or may not be produced by bands with direct affiliations to an established white nationalist group, then to be consistent, we probably have to start censoring violent drill rap with gang connections. In my survey of major music outlets online, there's little consistency even internally. We can listen to Screwdriver's seminal racist skinhead album, Boots and Braces on YouTube. We can also listen to Blue Eyes Devils there, Max Resist, and quite a bit of other racist skinhead music, but there's no definite hate or end apathy. Uh, none of that music is available to listeners on Spotify, and the BP song is offered on both. Now, rather than what is said, um, identifying and regulating violent extremist music online tends to be a rather ad hoc process formulated on the basis of who is singing, the actuated violence surrounding that who, and the subculture and its values from which the who is voicing a violent message. Uh, of course, more powerful is the influence of negative public opinion and headlines at pulling content down. Um, but as we all know, following public opinion as a metric of social norms against which extremism might be qualified is quite problematic. To close, I, I really don't have the answers to these questions, but I find them suggestive in ways that make me reflect upon music in more mainstream or normalized settings. Is some mainstream music articulating messages in ways similar to music that we might identify as qualifying as violent extremism? Upon a closer read, I think that there is a lot of music that comes close. And if we qualify it as such, then music may be normalizing aspects of violent extremism more readily than we think. Thank you so much. I look forward to um, any questions or comments you have. Let's stop my share. And I'll pass it to Ashton now. Thank you. It saves Stuart having to come back on. Um, can everyone see my slides, by the way, before I start? Marvellous. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the mainstreaming of the Nazi supernatural. This is some work that I have been doing as part of my thesis. So I've just finished up. Um, just a little warning, this will contain propaganda, some of which contains white supremacist symbols, but none of it is designed to be particularly insidious. So when I'm talking about mainstreaming, this is how I frame it in my work. I talk about far right themes and ideology that circulate from extremist milieus into the mainstream and back again through coded imagery. The blurring of mainstream and extreme messages has made the challenge of responding to the far right more difficult as rather than being a one way process whereby extremism enters the mainstream through the fringe, the two perspectives work in unison with information circulating in a mutually reinforcing loop. So back to the Nazi occult then. So the Nazis were absolutely obsessed with the occult. Here's a quote from Alfred Rosenberg in 1941. He claimed, the success of National Socialism, the unique appearance of the Führer has no precedent in German history. The consequence of these historic and unprecedented political occurrences is that for many Germans, due to their proclivity for the romantic and the mystical and the occult, came to understand the success of National Socialism in this fashion. So we know that extremists utilize popular culture frequently in their propaganda because people attracted to it. And popular culture is also obsessed with the Nazi occult. For example, Captain America contains all of the components of the Nazi supernatural in one film, including the connection to occult forces, 
mad scientists, fantastical weapons, a superhuman master race, a preoccupation with pagan religions, and magical relics that grant unlimited power. And we see this in other renditions of popular culture as well, including films like Hellboy and Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark, Captain America comic books, and video games like Castle Wolfenstein. So where we see mainstreaming then, quite a lot of the times you will see certain symbols on more mainstream social media platforms. The Sonnenrad is one of the most popular. So this is Wiebelsberg Castle, the original Castle Wolfenstein. Because this symbol is on the bottom of Wiebelsberg Castle, which was Heinrich Himmler's SS spiritual centre, um, very occult things going on here. It actually falls, falls through the cracks of many criminal laws because they ban symbols that were attributed to the Nazi party. So they fly under the radar and circumvent platform restrictions by having these specific symbols in there. We also see the combination of different runes that have been banned um, combined together, which creates a new optical content, which again is a way that they can mainstream their messages within certain images. So a lot of these kind of runes, these ideas about these kind of super Aryan races come from a theosophist called Madeleine Blavatsky, who argued that the earth goes through population cycles and every sort of hundred thousands of years, they will be destroyed either by themselves and their own destructive tendencies or natural cataclysms. So the idea was you had the Pilarians, the Hyperboreans, the Lemurians, the Atlanteans, and then you have now the, the sort of root race that we're in of the Aryan race, the golden age of which is ancient Greece and Rome, which is why you see so much propaganda within alt histories talking about, you know, we need to go back to these past civilizations that were seen as superior as the illusion for future utopian ethno states to flourish. So the ones I want to focus on, Hyperborea, it's the idea of this northern paradise with these superhuman warriors, they were eventually destroyed, but a few of them survived. Now, the idea of Hyperborea and Boreal Europe has been mainstreamed by several key figures in the kind of radical right milieu. We've got Thierry Bourdais in the Netherlands, John marie Le Pen, Alexander Dugan. So they're talking about this idea of Eurasia and this ethno state, right? This huge ethno state. Where is that? From Brest to Vladivostok. So when you see the word Boreal Europe used, this is a code word the way that European civilization has become the new code word that white supremacists use, again, to circumvent those platform restrictions. So if you're thinking about where this is, this is the idea of where Brest to Vladivostok will be, this ethno state. Now we also have Atlantis, this is a key one. So Atlantis, I'm sure many of you are more familiar with this, this technologically superior um, half human, half god, super race that re resided in this technologically superior utopia on concentric rings of land and water, eventually destroyed by a flood, as evidenced by Plato. So the Germans believed that Hyperboreans eventually became the Atlanteans. Now, this also links in with what the Nazis believed in world ice theory, which is a pseudo scientific idea that was kind of really propagated through the Third Reich based on Hans Horbiger's vision in 1894. And the theory supposedly proved that the Aryans were once these ice gods who ruled over people of other races. If you want to look into this, essentially he looked at the moon one night, decided that it was made of ice, and that was how different natural disasters had occurred across history, included Noah's flood. And it's apparently evidence that the Nazis were linked to this Hyperborean super race that eventually became the Atlanteans. So during its rise, the Nazi party leadership sought to promote its power by infiltrating every aspect of German life, bending the nation's history, culture, taste, and language to its cause. And one of the key means of indoctrination was the adoption of traditional folk tales as ideological weapons. And remember the Nazis were super interested in recruiting the youth of the Third Reich. Now the obsession with fairy tales um, you, comes from the Brothers Grimm. So I'm sure that many of us are aware of these fairy tales. We grew up with them, read them to your own children. Um, Snow White, Hansel and Gretel, Red Riding Hood. Interestingly, a lot of these fairy tales take place in the woods and that is important. So as part of my research, I have this kind of obsession with folklore. Um, 
I'm really interested in the ways in which these stories kind of become the products of collectives, so particular peoples in a particular time and place. So because Germany unified in 1871, they didn't have this kind of nationalist spirit that other countries had. So the Grimm's really wanted to inspire this and they went to folklore to get this. So they collected all of the stories in the surrounding area to kind of carve out this nationalist claim. Now, all of these key stories take place in the woods, which links back to this kind of idea that Germany's first defeat over Rome in 9 AD was the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. So this has very like spiritual and nationalistic elements within it. And a lot of these fairy tales contain these components of the woods. Now, in these stories, the wilderness and the woods is where you expel everything that you don't like, right? It's where you don't go who you don't know. And during that time, before we kind of have the caricatures of Jewish people that are familiar today, like the happy merchant, Jewish people and Slavic people were portrayed as the monsters within fairy tales. So I've censored quite a few of these out, but you can imagine, if you think about Hansel and Gretel, the types of people they're putting into ovens, right? That's the kind of meme culture we're going on. But the wolf, which is very common in propaganda, particularly in the Third Reich, is really important to folklore. So the widespread belief in lycanthropy, so a human with the ability to shapeshift into a wolf, this dates back to German folklore from the Middle Ages, when men would wear animal fur and go into the forest to transform fully. We still see this today. Think about the QAnon shaman, right? He was wearing this similar ensemble. So Germany's obsession with this claimed popularity in the Third Reich. Um, so people would portray certain Reich leaders, um, as Germanic wolves, um, all of these kind of secret ally, like infiltrating the allied, these operations were termed Operation Werewolf. Hitler's name itself was kind of this derivation of the animal, and he would refer to himself as this in many occasions throughout the war. And as I just mentioned previously, the historical evil counterpart to wolves, good nature and Germanic folklore, the vampire, became the preferred appellation for Jewish and Slavic people. And Nosferatu is a really good example of popular culture helping to kind of propel this stereotype into the public arena. So according to 18th, sorry, 19th and 20th century folklore, werewolves represented flaw but well-meaning characters who may be bestial but were tied to the woods, right, the blood and the soil, which represented German strength and purity against interlopers. So this idea of blood and soil is really important. So the concept that the blood of a nation is connected with ethnic identity by being drawn out of the soil and conditioned by food, residence and environment. And this signified this mystical bond between Germans and their land. So we're thinking about the way that this is becoming mainstream, particularly during the Third Reich. The 1866 Austro-Prussian War had left German speaking Austrians this kind of really isolated minority in a predominantly Slavic Austria-Hungary. So this resulted in insecurity, which helped lead to the growth of this powerful movement that invoked history, culture, and mythology to promote this unification of all Germans within a single fatherland. Some people call this Ariosophy, it's more popularly known as the Volkish movement. And this is linked in with Hitler's idea of Lebensraum, right? The idea that we needed more and more living space in order to survive links in with like biodynamic farming, this idea of ruralism going back to the land. So particularly during the coronavirus pandemic, we saw a lot of this kind of old school mixing of this Volkish movement propaganda. So the Ottoman is a Volkish movement um, kind of subculture. And the Hyperborean garden, right? So these are particular networks that I saw on Instagram where they're merging ideas of the Volkish movement going back to the land with this idea of a Hyperborean ethno state within these little clusters online. And then VK in Greenland Front um, propaganda, you would see a lot of this kind of obsession with these aesthetics coming out. So secure your future today. So kind of ripping off the 14 words, you've got blood and soil up there. If you can see this idea of survivalism, a lot of links with prepper communities, going back to nature, loving your folk, you would often see these kind of images where they would have these coded references. So in this one, for example, they're holding a pig 
This is a very clear indication of like an in-group, out-group vibe, right? So just like in Athens, when you would have these soup kitchens set up by Golden Dawn, when they were only served pork, quite traditionally, Jewish people and Muslims don't eat pork. So they include these kind of eco-fascist aesthetics with these code words in mind. Now, during COVID, I'm sure many of us saw these kind of um, the earth is healing itself uh, images, the images of animals running through the town. Um, the way that this kind of mainstreaming of these kind of old fashioned Volkish ideas and mythological ideas and COVID and going back to the land intersect is through this kind of window here. So it's super common for people to be concerned about the fact that we are depleting in resources. And everyone was, I think if everyone saw the panic buying around like toilet roll, everyone is concerned about the fact we don't have resources. But it was very easy for people to be legitimately concerned about the fact we're running out of resources and concerned about the climate crisis. And then tipping into these neo mufalsian views about overpopulation. And you would see this happening through these specific networks um, of environmentalism, combining in these different online subcultures, combining with these kind of old fashioned ideas of the Volkish movement and mythology, all coalescing together in these spaces. So one of the examples that is most important to me is I saw this meme in the mainstream news here in the UK, into the woods we go because kids won't remember their best day of television. Nothing wrong with that, right? A lot of people, because they had more time, were spending more time at home, were going out for walks, were making food from scratch. Everyone had more time. They wanted to connect with their families. I also saw this image on Tradwife forums, in eco-fascist communities, in QAnon networks, right? The ways in which this imagery and this idea about the climate crisis, combined with COVID and fears of overpopulation, were all coming together. So I essentially argue that the migration of far-right ideas from the periphery to the mainstream and of social media users in the opposite direction can be exemplified by the way the far-right stealthily draw on environmental discussions onto their own ideological terrain, nudging considerations regarding climate change onto topics of migration, race and overpopulation, whilst coding and cloaking language in which their arguments are cast to ensure their messages remain on the surface, at least within the accepted social boundaries of discussion and adhere to the terms and conditions of the platforms. So social media companies and platforms serve as these kind of inadvertent incubators for the gradual radicalization sometimes of mainstream users seeking to engage with environmental concerns and post pandemic solutions to climate change and equally unwittingly, social media users end up promoting the symbols, cultures and policies associated with far right values. And this kind of utilization of occult symbolism is a really good example of how quite a lot of the time people might be sharing content that they have no ideas about these occult, folkish movement, Third Reich backgrounds. So thank you so much for listening. I know I spoke really quickly, <laughs> so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, just a heads up, this is um, the Deglocker, this picture, I haven't actually spoken about it in my presentation, but if anyone's into your UFO conspiracy theories, this is allegedly the time traveling Nazi super bell. And when um, there was that mysterious object in Roswell, apparently it was this super bell crashing from the moon after the Nazis returned from their jolly. So yeah, thank you for listening. I'll stop sharing. Okay, well, thank you very much to all four panelists for really interesting and insightful presentations. Uh, while people are writing their questions in the chat, I'll start off with a question of my own. Uh, one of the, the themes that came across from all the presentations really was the role of culture on, on radicalization trajectories. What, what influence does culture have on radicalization trajectories? And I wanted to ask a bit about how we can go about researching that. And that's the question really I'd like to, to ask each of you is, what do you think are some of the methodological and ethical challenges in trying to 
research that and have you any ideas or suggestions for how those challenges could be overcome? Maybe if I could pick on Suraj first of all. <laughs> sure, let's do it. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a challenging area. I suppose the, the first aspect to think about is that um, the research that's present on um, video games and violent extremism hasn't conclusively found that uh, the intersection between video games and violent extremism is uh, a radicalizing agent. Um, that doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist. Um, what we found so far is that this intersection um, builds communities and kind of develops the online extremist ecosystem uh, and serves other functions, but there needs to be kind of more research in this area. When we're thinking about the intersection uh, in terms of kind of everyday extremism or the normalization and mainstreaming of far right extremism, a lot of that in video games, as I mentioned in the presentation, is done um, either by text uh, or uh, a lot by my, uh, voice chat as well. And I think the, I suppose the, the, the kind of methodological and ethical issues that are really present in that space is about how do we collect that data? How do we collect voice data whilst kind of maintaining privacy? Um, it's not like kind of collecting uh, text data where you can then search that data for particular uh, terminologies or sentences or individual words that you're looking for with voice data voice data, it's a little bit more difficult unless you've got kind of specific programs that are going to kind of pick out key terms so that's kind of one of the real key issues around um looking at the kind of intersection between video game and violent extremism but anyone else like to jump in on on the methods and ethics question I guess I can say a few words when it comes to uh, actually methodological and also ethical issues of uh, challenges of uh, exploring violent uh, jihadi extremists. It's extremely difficult to get access to um, the ideal type of data sometimes that you want to uh, explore some types of research questions because the research questions that we can explore are limited because it can be based on some uh, data that is essentially uh, is accessible such as magazines, videos by these groups, uh, online presence that they have, but um, other um, methods that could be insightful to collect some data such as interviews, for example, to get um, into an in-depth understanding of how some individuals uh, make sense of uh, their activities in the culture of the group who are involved in that would be extremely difficult at least for um, academic and scholars to pass uh, through ethics committee to actually uh, conduct that type of research so we are limited in a sense that we can collect data that is um, out there and available um, but well, even if, for example, if sometimes I know some colleagues uh, in the US collect data via social media platforms, but it is basically the data that is uh, um, that is out and they they observe as an observant but they cannot engage uh, with the day with the uh, subjects they cannot ask questions they cannot dig deeper um into uh what is going on and what's happening and uh, um so it it is very limited uh, the data that we have available and jonathan i think you've actually been able to do some ethnographic research um of the music scene so what was your experience yeah i um um thanks um yeah i um it was about starting about 10 years ago i um started looking at music um within the context of the american racist skinhead scene um something that i had spent several years prior to that just doing research on um and i had been um fortunate enough to kind of go into that scene and um in understanding how it works was able to um attend racist uh, skinhead shows um in the united states kind of in the early 2010s um and uh it was a very it was very, it's been very interesting i'll just say it's been very interesting to see the transformation of um that subculture over the last decade where it has really gone from something that um i wouldn't say was necessarily thriving but was um 
definitely sustaining and um, to something that now really seems to almost have uh, fallen by the wayside. And um, yeah, my, my experience was, was very interesting insofar as that it reinforced to me just how important non-ideological factors were at forging the subculture. Um, when I went to these shows, there was very little that was actually talked about in terms of, you know, true ideology. Um, you had, I, you know, found some of those people. Um, there was one woman who wanted to get all the guys in the, in the subculture, all the racist skinhead guys to learn German by a Rosetta Stone. And so she was trying to get pirated versions of Rosetta Stone to teach them all German. Um, but that most of the time it was almost, it had an environment much more kind of like a, a back, backyard barbecue with bands. Um, it was beer infused, it was music infused, and everybody came together through the music. Um, and so um, it, it really kind of, um, to me, it, it pointed me in the direction that <clears throat> to, to look at some of these other types of factors that were catalyzing involvement um, in the scene, um, and in particular the role that emotion played in a variety of ways um, at how people got into um, that particular subculture. Thank you. And Ashton, did you want to say anything about methods or ethics? I mean, where do you want me to start, Stuart, with the ethics question? What was your actual question? Can you just repeat it? What was it you wanted to know? Well, one of the, the issues that I think came across from all of the, the presentations was understanding more about the role that culture plays in radicalization yeah. trajectories, if any, but how can we as a research community investigate that from a methodological and an ethical point of view? Um, yeah, so I had like loads of different sock puppet accounts in all different networks for about three years. So I think the problem is to actually understand how the cultures work and operate. You, it takes time um, and it takes a lot of navigating the institutional blockades that can come your way if you're going to go into these communities particularly from a safety perspective mental health things like that but I do think that so my work really focuses more on the coding and cloaking of propaganda and how to unravel that and then essentially advise whoever it is whether it be social media and companies governments about the issues that are on there so I think it's challenging in that it needs to be done but it is difficult it's a long process it's very stressful it's very depressing and I think all of that needs to be taken into account in terms of research ethics um you know Ashley and I focus on institutional responsibility for people to care for their researchers and like there's just not the support available for people, particularly if you're going to put yourself out there with your results. Um, and I think that's more of the problem. Like it's all well and good that everyone wants to do this research, but who's there at the end when the shit hits the fan and, you know, you might get a social media pile on or something. And I think that that is important as well when you're doing this kind of subcultural research, right? Going into these really niche areas. And I think, um, well, that's a piece of work that some Voxpol colleagues are currently engaged in trying to uh, produce resources to help uh, enhance the understanding of ethics review boards so that they have a better appreciation of the, the type of work that we need to do. Um, just moving on to another issue I wanted to ask about, and everyone pretty much touched on content moderation, and I just wanted to talk about that a bit more um, fully. And I wanted to separate it out into the two issues, really. You've got desirability and feasibility. And I think all of you touched on at least one of those at, at one point or another in your presentations. But perhaps if we could just talk a bit more about is content moderation of the content that you've described feasible, first of all, and then even if it is feasible, is it desirable? Um, so maybe I'll... I'll change the order up a bit this time perhaps um Jonathan as you probably spoke the most to this do you mind going first sure on this? sure I um I definitely think that in terms of you know content moderation of of music that um we have traditionally used the idea of linking 
music that is or recitation that's produced from a specific group. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it makes it pretty easy in the context of Salafi jihadist groups or groups that are really trying to brand and franchise themselves, uh, where they have a lot invested in slapping their uh, logos on things. Um, and I think it can be a bit, you know, I understand the arguments that, that say leave the stuff up um, because, you know, for, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but I, I think that with a lot of it, I, I do think that it should be pulled down. Um, and I, I think that it does have, it, I think it emboldens them to realize that they can kind of navigate some of these terrains um, unnoticed, particularly in terms of the the propaganda that they're they're producing, because I think it also represents a a step up in any kind of extremist organization to begin producing this stuff. Actually, I mean, it took IS quite a while to figure this out, um, and it wasn't really until the declaration of the caliphate in June of 2014 that they really kind of doubled down on their whole propaganda machine. Um, so I, I think that you know the issue of, of content moderation is definitely a, a difficult one. Um, I, my feeling is that you know when it comes from from certain groups, it, it should definitely be um, you know, pulled down. Um, I'll defer to my my other colleagues who may th think a little differently um, about the issue, but. Um, We do. Yes, so I totally agree with Jonathan that for some groups, this has to be, it is desirable to moderate the content and the groups that I study, um, Al-Qaeda, IS, Islamic State, and to a certain degree, Tahrik Taliban, it is the material that they used to produce and they were sort of easily available online. Um, now it has become a lot more difficult to get uh, to get that material for research purposes. So there has been a good level of success in moderating that uh, content. Um, however, then the Taliban is one group here that I've been studying and following them, uh, um, following certain social media activities of the group for a good few years now. But the Taliban is a different group uh, that. Um, Interestingly enough, despite the material that even now they post the Taliban members, which is violent and by any standards and policies of social media platforms such as Twitter and Facebook, they should be shut down. And Facebook has taken some uh, measures and does not allow the Taliban or certain, even though they're in control of Afghanistan right now and some, some of the ministries to have a uh, Facebook presence. Um, Twitter has given them a free hand up to a certain degree until recently, and the material that uh, Taliban um, uh, fighters and militants are posting online on Twitter, if it were by any other group, they should have definitely, they would have probably been taken down, but it is full of hatred, uh, encouraging violence, uh, um, but it does, it is there and uh, it's not reported, even if some of them are reported, it, I don't see how, I don't see any um, effective measure uh, taken against the Taliban uh, when it comes to um, Twitter, for example. Um, so yes, there has been, it is desirable, and uh, but it, it depends on the type of material and where the type of material and where these groups are present online. Um, so it is sometimes easy for some uh, social media platforms to just uh, um, take them down, but some others, they can go without detection or even if they are detected, nothing happens to them. And so, Raj, you've, you've touched on this already, um, talking about things like live content and so on. Um, do you want to say a bit more? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, before I say that, I just want to clarify one thing. So when I said um, uh, video games is kind of radicalizing agents, um, I didn't mean that there's a kind of causal factor between video gaming and radicalization. It's, there's not enough evidence to show whether video games are used as tools uh, for radicalization. Um, yeah, in terms, of, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. It's a really, really difficult question to, to answer, particularly when looking at um, far right extremist subcultures within video gaming or around issues around gamification. Um, so, if we take uh, the Christchurch uh, attack as one particular example, and if we look at the Christchurch attackers' manifesto, 
Um, within that, there was a lot of what, what we refer to as shitposting, things that were meant to be uh, off the cuff remarks, uh, things that were meant to be, uh, you know, quotes, jokes, uh, in jokes. And there's, you know, this was, this was a purposeful strategy by the perpetrator for a number of reasons. Um, one of them might be to say to the audience that he's aiming that at, that I'm, you know, I'm one of you, I'm an insider, I'm an internet insider, you know, accept me into your circle, support my actions, uh, promote my actions. Um, another reason that that he outlined and other, other people on 8chan and Telegram outlined uh, as a purposeful strategy afterwards was to kind of include as much shit posting and memes as possible because it it kind of puts reporters and academics off the scent, which is, you know, which for, 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 which is for numerous reasons, including you know, it apparently being funny as well. Um, some of this is is purposeful as well, and it's to it's to access a wider set of people, right? It's to use uh, uh, cultural symbols or terminology or approaches to um, disseminate that propaganda to people who. Um, are part of different kind of subcultures or, or different groups, including um, including gamers, including um, um, frequenters of image boards, uh, inc including a wide range of people. But I suppose what, what the point I'm coming to is that some of this is difficult because these symbols and subculture changes, and it changes quite a lot, right? And we saw that with the Pepe, the me the frog memes. We saw that with the OK symbol. We've seen that with lots of different symbols that's kind of taken on different meanings as we've got we've gone on and it's it's about interpretation and when you're thinking about moderating and when you're looking across different countries that becomes particularly difficult especially when we consider you know freedom of speech laws uh, and how they differ and approaches in terms of uh, uh, acceptance of some of these symbols so in order to moderate it's a difficult space as it is but i think the first step and something that's happening increasingly, thankfully, is that there needs to be co-production of this moderation by tech companies, but also by academics and researchers who look at this issue on a day-to-day -day basis and can really provide an understanding of how these symbols change or the meanings behind these symbols change as well. And I give, if I, if I can share my screen, I give one particular example, uh, if that's okay, Stuart. Um, so I show this, uh, if you can, uh, can you see that on on the screen? Uh, I showed this to my students uh, of you know all of my terrorism undergraduate classes, and I and I asked them where where I took that picture, and a lot of them gasped. And I you know this is obvious to us as academic ter terrorism researchers, right? Where where I'm going with this, but a lot of them gasp and say, "Oh, I hope that's not on campus." You know, was that a hate group? Um, but this picture was taken at my mum's house. This is my mum's front door, right? My mum's a practicing Hindu, and this is originally a, a Hindu sign. As, you know, Ashton would, would attest to, you know, to some of her own research. So if, if someone like my mum put this on social media or this was uploaded by somebody who was uh, shit posting or uh, had, had kind of uh, affiliation with far-right extremist groups, then the intent is different. And for something like this, it's, it might be a slightly more easier to kind of decipher. But when you come to um, kind of obscure memes and obscure terminology, and then that come, becomes far harder. I'll stop sharing my screen. And that actually connects quite nicely with a, a question in the chat, which is for Ashton. Um, so, Siraj, you've highlighted how quickly the, the meaning of symbols can evolve and, and change. And the question in the chat is asking really about what can we do to kind of raise awareness of, of those who are sharing content inadvertently? Um, so I think that the two questions raise a similar issue, which is about how can we increase people's awareness of what they might be sharing. Ashton, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, um, stay tuned for my book, I will say, because that does do a lot of uncoding and cloaking. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. I actually spend a lot of time talking about the history and manifestation of symbols because a lot of the time people don't understand what they're sharing or the history of where that comes from. I remember in the aftermath of George Floyd, I wrote this article about where the uh, black people love fried chicken stereotype comes from. And then it actually comes from the Klan and a birth of a nation, you know, where 
black people were seen in the house of representatives ostentatiously eating fried chicken and like people don't know this right they just have no clue at all what Siraj is saying is really interesting as well about the symbol like in my lectures I show the swastika on the coca-cola so the coca-cola swastika and Roger Kipling swastika on his books like everyone loves Winnie the Pooh right so <laughs> they just can't believe that this symbol that was hijacked by the Nazis and now obviously has so much hatred attached to it is actually seen in different cultures as a different type of symbol. Um, I think just, I wanted to touch on your content moderation question as well, because like it's really difficult for social media companies, particularly when you're getting into this blurring of boundaries between the fringe and the mainstream and you're looking at like, when is a, a spitfire when is Spitfire bunting extreme, right? Or when is a scon extreme? Like when you're in these really weird intersections of like cottagecore and tradwife and QAnon, it's like explaining to people how that's potentially extreme when a lot of people are just so used to seeing that imagery and quite a lot of people in the mainstream, like normal people, believe in some conspiracy theories related to QAnon. So I think it's even more difficult to try and explain how that propaganda might be deemed extreme. Plus there's also the added thing of when you try sometimes people go on the defensive thinking that you're calling them an extremist if they're using this kind of imagery or symbols. And sometimes I feel like with social media companies you fight this kind of uphill battle because it's really difficult for them to get into the space of monitoring this like content moderation is not great um yes i think it's done better at associating the more extreme symbols and the more you know well-known symbols but like i'm working on a project at the moment with the turing institute and that's basically on using ai to find these more hidden niche european civilization types of extremism so that can be automatically taken down so yeah, there's just a few thoughts. Thank you. And I guess also something else that Sir I said a moment ago was about researchers working with tech companies to help their moderation efforts. Um, I'm just wondering, kind of, do do you feel like that would be seen as quite controversial within the research community? Um, are there different views on? researchers roles when it comes to I mean um, I think they'd actually have to listen to you for a start which in my opinion they most of the time do not in my experience when I've raised issues I've not been listened to and that includes the police like when you tell the police that something's happening and I remember having this conversation in something that Maura was doing and that the question by the panel was like do you tell the police and I'm like yeah I do and they do not care if I see someone organizing some sort of rally around an event, I will phone the police and they do not care. <laughs> so I feel like sometimes that you're fighting a bit of an uphill battle with these kind of questions and like trying to get people to take these sorts of things more seriously. And moving on from that, I just wanted to ask about directionality, because uh, I suppose the kind of the premise of the the workshop was looking at how extremist ideas or concepts find their way into the mainstream. But something that, that you raised, Ashton, that's quite interesting is thinking of how maybe directionality operates in the other direction and how the mainstream can perhaps influence how extremist ideas are communicated or couched. Um, so I wonder really if any of the other panelists have come across that kind of that phenomenon where it's actually the mainstream shaping how extremist ideas are expressed. Um, I'll, I'll uh, offer a few thoughts on that. I, I'm not sure that it's exactly in the way that like the music influences the, the mainstream. I, I think one of the points that I was trying to offer in my presentation was that some of these ideas are actually already with us in the mainstream. Um, and that the evolution of something like music um, is an interesting case study of where certain ideas, particularly misogyny, um, has been, now become something that we fundamentally accept. Um, it's perfectly fine for, you know, misogynist 
voices to be to sound within certain genres of music. And what's interesting is if you look historically as to how that has shaped, you know, you, you couldn't 40 years ago have, you know, you wouldn't have Eminem's Kim, you wouldn't have the ghetto boys and the idea of a romanticization and a glamorization of rape. Um, and yet for some reason that had, that music has kind of become all right. And over time to the point that we're, we're perfectly okay um, accepting that type of thing. Um, and so I particularly, as it relates to, I think, you know, violence and, and misogyny, um, I think that those ideas are, those things happening are a little bit closer to the mainstream um, than perhaps we think. Um, so I hope I didn't, I, I hope I didn't come across as somebody like from the 1980s and PMRC, you know, I was, I, I'm a little older than the rest of the panelists. And so like, I, I was there, you know, I was with my public enemy t-shirt when I was a teenager and all that. And so it kind of feels weird to say those things, but um, at the same time, kind of seeing where some of these genres and where music was just called in the late eighties and early nineties. And then now seeing what is, you know, kind of perfectly acceptable, could be even top 40 and the messages that are underlying in it and just how explicit some of the um the misogyny is and, and the violence is um it, it makes me question if in a sense the the extremism is is being normalized much more um than we think and would any of the other panelists like to, to come in on the issue of directionality well, if I give the, I mean, this is common sense, if I give the example of Afghanistan with the Taliban, I mean, they are really working hard to make their ideologies and everything um, a normal uh, trend in Afghanistan. So taken from religious education to culture to everything. So when extremist groups come in power, then all the more easy for them um, to uh, uh, to make the extreme ideologies uh, more normal and the normalization of extremism happens much easier and is facilitated. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ashton and also Raj. Or should we move on to the next question? I would just say that, yeah, I do our, like my whole thesis. I take inspiration from... Um, a combination of Aaron Winter's sort of vision of mainstreaming and then also Cynthia Miller-Idris's, I kind of smash them together, um, but argue also that it comes back. So they, they work together in unison, uh, the fringe and the mainstream, and that's when it becomes much more difficult to try and counter it when both of them are um, utilising each other's imagery. Um, and I think that that's just my opinion and what I argued in my thesis is that I think that people's understanding of what mainstreaming is um, could kind of, people could maybe benefit from thinking about it in a slightly different way. Um, just because a lot of the literature I've seen talks about it coming from the fringe into the mainstream, say, you know, via politics. Um, so I think that's important to consider it as this kind of like mutually reinforcing loop sometimes. Thank you. Um, we've got time for two more questions, which are, are in the chat. So I'll just uh, go through both of them and then you can choose which ones you take. Uh, so we've got a question from Michael first, which is about uh, using these kinds of materials, whether it's racist memes or music examples in our published research. Um, and Michael says he, he's had discussions at places he's worked about this, because on the one hand, you're propagating it by including it in publications. But on the other hand, it is part of your data set and it's hard to really understand the phenomenon if you're not providing actual examples in the, the publication. So is that an issue that any of you have considered? And, and while you're thinking about that, we have a question that was uh, posted earlier by one of our students who's attending and asking about how students can get involved in in research projects on these kinds of themes. So, so Raj, would you like to take one of those questions? Uh, yes. Um, it, so Michael's question, it, it's, it's really difficult. We, we've kind of had this debate and there's, you know, really kind of strong opposing 
arguments on either side on this debate. And we've had that, you know, we've had this for years and years, ever since, you know, uh, various people have been uh, posting Islamic State propaganda or retweeting Islamic State propaganda or sharing it on social media. And this argument about, you know, where is the line between just uh, distributing propaganda or really addressing the kind of core issues associated with that propaganda and as academics unpicking that and demonstrating the issues with that and I think I think sometimes it's quite easy to determine that you know if you're just sharing stuff on social media or if you're just reposting stuff on social media from a, an extremist organization with little kind of understanding about the issues associated with that I think that that's a problem but as academics if we were to write a journal article and put a picture in there or put uh, song lyrics in there or put uh, a meme in there and really start to think about what the issues are of that image or piece of music or whatever it is. And by understanding how we begin to counter that problem, then I, I, then I don't think that's a problem. But I think this is a really interesting question and an important question and one that's kind of, you know, like I said, we've been having for a very, very, very long time. Um, but for me, it's all about kind of as academics, we really do need to engage with this. Um, but, uh, you know, Michael, again, you know, it's, it's, it's important to think about and really at every step before we use particular uh, uh, material to really think through it. And um, myself and a, and a colleague, Suzanne Widlitska, recently uh, released an, uh, an empirical piece of uh, research in terrorism and political violence, which looked at the uh, gamification of the Christchurch attack. And we took data from 8chan and before we used any screenshot we had hours and hours of discussion between us about whether we should use that image and what the point was of using that image and actually did the value kind of outweigh the negativity of using that image and we started off with 15 20 images and in the end i think we used three or four because we actually had those conversations we took the time to have those conversations and we also made a decision not to um, post the uh, attacker's name either and I know some people do um, and in other publications I may do but Suzanne's part of uh, a university in New Zealand and actually as the attack took place in New Zealand there are different sensitivities around that we kind of have to think about that as well we have to think about different sensitivities around the world and, and try and respect that um, as much as possible. Um, in terms of the second question, I'll be very brief. Um, uh, students can contribute uh, uh, to Voxpol in lots of different ways. If you go to the Voxpol website, there's lots of different resources on there and ways you can get involved. Uh, we've also got a, a lecture series, uh, which is uh, uh, available to uh, students at Voxpol uh, institutions. Um, and uh, details of that will be sent out by email as well. Would any of the other panelists like to, to speak to Michael's question about? Um... I would, if that's OK, because I yeah, have that's... to think about this quite carefully because my entire thesis was based on 20,000 far right images. So essentially, if my book's focusing on um, the coding and cloaking of far right propaganda, it's um, important to show the coding and cloaking of propaganda. Um, but that being said, and I was aware of like, some of the content that I'd seen was obviously like really bad. Um, and I was aware of the fact that it was being read by, or well, Siraj was one of the people, but also another person. And it was like, I, I, I basically embargoed my um, data set and I am not releasing it. I will never release it. Um, and I've carefully chosen the pictures that can convey the narrative without, well, with causing the least offense that I've sent, like, you have to think about it from a common sense perspective. Obviously, I can't say that none of the images that I publish might not offend certain people. Um, but, you know, you put warnings in and stuff like that, but I think you can talk about it and convey the messages without showing the more insidious pictures or, the more insidious narratives like how I censored some of the images today because I can talk about it and you can use your imaginations and like if people want to leave and look them up they can and I think that's an important conversation to have but as Siraj was saying there are people that just flat out do not want you to share any images um 
especially in publications because you're glorifying extremist narratives and stuff like that but it is really tricky um to warn people <laughs> if you can't show them what they need to be looking out for so yeah i think it's an interesting debate and we how have you manage this um this situation with you, with your work looking at uh, jihadist propaganda we basically the publications with our work is publications and journal articles we uh we have excerpts from uh some of these uh, the textual material or describing videos for example uh but then we are also very careful and we discuss um, we discuss uh, amongst ourselves, the researcher groups, what we what a good example is to show what we are saying and uh, to show that um, the premises of these, uh, the logic and premises of the logics of these groups and what they are saying, but also uh, choosing an example that is not offensive to the reader or is less offensive to um, but to a variety well various readers so but it's a tough decision at the end of the day do i do agree with one point that suraj raised and i want to emphasize that we do see that's one thing in like academic work in in journal articles or books and stuff that we as a scholars we do discuss these issues and bring in examples but there's another thing that scholars or journalists go online and post something on social media on twitter and I've come across this multiple of times that they posted uh, a very short video by IS, by Al Qaeda, or the Taliban. Look how look at this new production of this group and what they show. Look at okay, yes, the message is horrible. Yes, the uh, uh, special effects and they comment on the special effects, for example, is terrible. But at the same time. That is exactly what the Taliban wants. That's exactly what Al Qaeda wants to get broader audience and circulation. So, and then basically, when I see that, my jaws drop. Why are we doing this? Because that's what they want to get, like, to get more attention, to propagate their message further and further. And they feed on to that, and they just say, "Look how much traction our message has gotten." So we need to be extremely careful. Um, in what we publish as examples. And um, that applies also to our uh, res uh, well, to our teaching to in, in the classroom as well. Um, we are all very, I mean, we discuss and we, we need to consider. And so we even fill out applications to the ethics committee if we have to take some of this material and show it to the class or for a class exercise um, in an academic setting. Good. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'd like to uh, thank all four panellists for really excellent presentations and a really helpful discussion. Um, and as, as we've mentioned, there is a VoxPoll lecture series for students who are at a VoxPoll institution. So please do look out for details of the, the VoxPoll lectures for the remainder of the term from your uh, module directors. Um, and have a look at the VoxPol website for the other resources that we provide there. But thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And thank you again to our panellists and have a good rest of the day.